Check one, two. All right, folks, good morning. Welcome to church. Sorry for the brief delay. We're just uh, getting rolling here. Livia, you're ready for us at the back. Thank you very much. Got a new face behind me this morning, and uh, if you haven't met him already, he's uh, tucked away. His name is Dan, so we're glad to have Dan with us this morning, and we give him a warm welcome. So always a tremendous blessing when uh, someone says, oh, pastor, I'm willing to help, and uh, I can play any instrument that you want me to, so, and he can play. He helped us out last week after the service, had a little jam session. He's uh, going to play along with us this morning. But why don't you stand together and uh, do a little wave, a smile to the person that's either behind you, beside you. Tell them you're glad they're here today. As we sing this morning about God's grace, God's power, I hope your heart is full this morning of thanksgiving to God. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Yes. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing, this is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Yes, Lord, we thank you for what you've done for us, oh God While we were yet undeserving while we were yet sinners, you would die in our place. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations? Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life. I sing for all that you've done for me. And worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the King. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Yes, Lord. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy is His amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. I was buried beneath my shame. Yes, Lord. 
who could carry that kind of weight. It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You call my name because you call my when I met you. My sin's heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan, but now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, and now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. My sin was heavy, the chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, but now you call me a citizen of heaven. morning. We have new life in Christ. What a blessing today to be called children of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated and uh, we'll take a minute. You can catch some water, catch your breath. I know it's warm now. It's starting to get warmer Sunday morning, so we'll try to keep the fans going. If you need to open up the window, you're beside one, feel free to do that. But uh, rather have the warm weather than the cold weather. That's just me. I know some of you might not agree, but a couple of quick announcements today before we uh, 
carry on with our time of worship. And uh, one of the things that we're excited about this summer, we mentioned last week that we were looking to hire on a summer student to help us with some gardening and some lawn care. And so she's not with us here this morning, but uh, we are excited to say that Janelle is going to be hired on for the summer, Ernesta's daughter. So uh, we'll look forward to having her with us. She's going to have to work hard. There's lots of grass to mow, if you didn't notice, and lots of whippersnipping. And so she's up for the task, and she'll be learning about gardening just like I've been doing. And so if you want to get involved, then we still would love for you to help us out. Uh, I know a couple of folks have already jumped in and started cleaning up some of the garden beds and uh, started planting. You're welcome to do that. You don't have to wait for me to tell you. Go ahead. Just let me know. We need to make sure we know who's got what planted where. But uh, we want to get going, of course, with the weather now turning around, being nice. So that's the plan. Uh, Keep you posted to that. You reach out to me if you want to get planting out front. I also mentioned last week, we got another slide. Pastor Matt and Michelle have agreed to join us here at Corridor Church in an official capacity as an assistant pastor. They're going to volunteer their ministry and time. And so we're blessed to have them on board with us. They're not here this morning. Uh, stayed home. They weren't quite feeling well, so they took the precaution to just stay home. And they'll, of course, be online tonight. Some of you who are watching the online services, you have Pastor Matt to thank for that. He's helped us out with that uh, even after his internship was done. So we'll continue to look forward to having them involved and having them a part of what we're doing. And as they continue to grow and learn in ministry, they've been a blessing. I think, is there some other here? We want to make sure, again, we thank you for those who are giving. Uh, It's important, of course, we still have lots of responsibilities and commitments financially that we need to meet week to week, month to month. And so as each one of us give out of obedience to God through those different ways to give, of course, then uh, we're investing in God's kingdom, investing in the local church here in the corridor As more and more people move to the area, of course, and looking for a church where they can plug in and uh, get involved and hear the gospel, we want this place to be an exciting place. We we want it to be a place that's welcoming and inviting and open and thriving. And to do all of that, we need a few dollars to make it happen, okay? It's like anything in life. We all know what it costs this day and age. So thank you for your giving. We pray again, those who give, that God would richly bless your faithfulness, your sacrifice. Uh, each week as you give and I think that pretty well does it oh no the family chat thank you Olivia Pastor Matt made this announcement last week for those who missed it that uh, we're going to get together on Saturday this coming Saturday June the 4th at 6 30 we're going to have some dessert together those who uh, want to do that if you don't if you're still a little bit nervous on the COVID front you're just welcome to come and attend We'll have some tables set up. We're going to do it up here so everyone can have access. It's accessible for people to come on Saturday evening. Spend an hour or a couple of hours together. It's very casual. There's no agenda. Uh, Just want to have the opportunity to meet some folks or some new folks that you might not have gotten to talk to here at church in the past few Sundays. So hopefully as you come, you'll sit, you'll fellowship together. Uh, You might have some questions. You're welcome to come ask some questions about the church or the pastors who are here if you're not familiar with us and our families. So we're going to have a very laid back, fun family night. Uh, I hope you can make it. Just sign up at the back so we have an idea of how many to set up for. Remember I said last week, those who were here, that for Pastor Matt, it's it's a lesson in ministry. You set up for 50 and only get five. But if you know there's five, you set up for five and you're glad that those five come. So it's not about who comes and how many. We just want to have a, a, a night together, some fellowship and discussion. So that's that's the announcements, if I'm right. All right. We're going to continue worship. I know the little friends who are up and around are looking for the movie, but we're going to do that after while we continue to worship. You can remain seated for this one just while we start to sing together. Again, the songs today are deliberate in that we are going to be talking about what it means when we are, unfortunately, we find ourselves failing in the area of sin in our life. King David was was found himself in that situation. Some of us might know the story, but we're going to sing about God's mercy and love and faithfulness. Here's a song, again, we may not have done it here, but 
I think you've probably heard it if you listen to any Christian radio. So sing it along if you know it, Olivia. It's gonna, we're going to jump. We're going to do King of Kings. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. Sing the chorus again. Praise the Father. And praise the Father. Praise the Son. To reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation, Jesus for our sake you died. This gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not fade. By his blood and in his name, and it is freedom, I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Yes, Lord. stand together and sing it out one more time. Praise the Father. And praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Three in one. God of glory. God of glory. Majesty.
Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Beneath the shade of all our sin, you bow to none but heaven. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Come awake, come awake. Come and rise up from the grave. Hallelujah. Let's sing this out with all our hearts today. That we believe in Jesus and his power today. I believe in the Son. I believe in the risen one I believe I overcome by the power of his blood Amen Amen I'm alive I'm alive because he Dead in the grave, covered in sin and shame. I was covered in sin and shame. Hallelujah. I heard mercy. I heard mercy call my name. He rolled the stone. Because he lives. 
Savior today. What hope we have, oh God, that we could be made new, made alive in Christ. Once we were lost, once we were blind, now we see. Hallelujah. What a great miracle to celebrate new life in Christ, new hope, new purpose, oh God. We give you thanks this morning. Dead in the grave, living a hopeless life, a life of darkness with no purpose, O oh God, but now made new and alive in you. We praise your wonderful name. We love you this morning. We thank you, God, for your goodness. We thank you for your spirit, your presence today. Hallelujah. Jesus, our risen Lord, our Savior, our King, our Messiah. We thank you for this day, for this opportunity to worship you, Lord, together, to be gathered together with believers of faith today. Hallelujah. We thank you for this opportunity even now as we join our hearts, O oh God, in a moment of prayer. Those that are here today that are in need, O oh God, we pray in the mighty and precious and powerful name of Jesus that you would meet every need today, God. Everyone that's sick, God, those that couldn't even be here this morning, maybe who are home, who are battling sickness today, battling anxiety or depression, oh God, who are going through moments of grief, oh God, or turmoil or chaos, God, I pray that we would learn by faith to surrender it to you, God. Hallelujah. Not to carry those burdens, those concerns anymore, but to trust in you, to trust that you are a good father that loves us so much, that is able to do far and exceeding above anything we could ever ask or imagine, God. Pray today your blessing upon your people, God. Pray for your blessing today upon our community, Lord, those that don't yet know you, for your mercy, that mercy we've been singing about today, for that new life, that miracle salvation today, to be in their hearts and their spirit, Lord, that they would sense and know that they need a Savior that they can have deliverance and freedom today from a life of bondage and a life of sin. Help us to be the instruments, the messengers that you've called us to be, God, to spread the good news to those around us. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. We thank God today. You may be seated and uh, thank God for his presence today, his goodness for our time of worship. Thank you to the team. That's... Uh, Take a break for a few moments. Stories of the Bible. David's Prayers. This is David. Hello. David was the second king of Israel. Yeah. He was a great warrior. Oh! He loved God with all of his heart, and he prayed to God often. Hmm. David loved God so much that he wanted to give him a special house to live in. Yeah, that's it. But God told David that it wasn't his plan for David to build this house. Even so, David thanked God for all he had done for him. He praised God for the great God that he is. Hmm. David wrote many psalms, which are prayers and songs to God that are in the Bible. In many of his psalms, David began by thanking and praising God. 
he thanked God for answering his prayers and giving him victory over his enemies. He thanked God for guiding him and showing him the right path to take. David thanked God for always being with him. Even when David was an old man, he thanked God in front of all the people of Israel for all that he had done. He said to the people, Give praise to the Lord your God. David talked to God his whole life, and this is one reason why God said, I have found a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to. All right, as I mentioned, thank you to Pastor Matt, who's keeping up with the videos and the editing. And if you miss a Sunday and you're curious to keep up with the study about the kings thus far, we've been making our way through. And again, I know that for some, the Old Testament is not super exciting, but I hope you've been learning and God has been speaking to your hearts through our study together. So last Sunday's study and sermon and service is on tonight. It's a Sunday be, uh, behind, so you can always catch up or catch up from previous Sundays. Thank you again to the work that Pastor Matt's doing for us. So far in our study of Kings, in our sermon series up till now, most of what we've talked about has been all of the good attributes of King David, of David even before coming king when he was anointed as a young man. We talked about that as a teenager, that God had this incredible calling and anointing on his life, that he would serve as a king, an incredibly good king, a king that was after God's own heart. We saw that in the video today. So all of it has looked, painted King David to be this great model Christian king, and he was. He served God faithfully and had a heart after God. But there's something now in today's lesson that's going to maybe balance out our view of King David. He was just a person like you and I who, unfortunately, as Scripture records for us, had his own hang-ups and challenges when it came to sin. And this is a, probably the easiest point to make as we begin our time together today that even those who love and respect God, and I believe everyone here has a love and a respect for God, every one of us, all of us are vulnerable to temptation and sin. That's a, that's a lesson that probably all of us have learned along our journey in life of faith, that even though we endeavor to serve God faithfully and we have a heart for God and a deep love and respect, which King David did, all of us are still vulnerable to being tempted to fall into sin in our lives. And it's, it's unfortunate, it's messy, and it's something that probably brings shame in our hearts and lives when especially we know that we know the difference of sin and allowing it to enter into our lives. But yet we find ourselves struggling with it anyway. The bigger question that King David faces in today's study and we also do need to face in our lives is how do we respond when we find ourselves in that situation? How does King David respond in his life when he finds himself struggling with sin? We talked about how he, how he responded to the success, to the fame that was accumulating through his reign, through God's blessing on him as king. And he handled that quite well, quite admirably. How would he handle sin, failure? How would he handle sin in his life? Let's Turn in your Bibles, if you have your apps or your Bible with you and you want to follow along, to Second Samuel. And again, we've been skipping along. We're not going chapter by chapter, but we're journeying through the highlights and in this case today, the lowlights of King David, learning and asking God how it applies to our, our life and our faith. This is, of course, again, anyone who maybe have grown up in church or read the story before of David, you probably know this story well as well. It's David's most famous sin. He's committed a few in his life and reign in the history of Israel. We're not looking at all of them, but this one in particular, where David commits the sin of infidelity and uh, adultery here. We're going to read it in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Starting at verse 2, that it says later, one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed 
And he was walking on the roof of the palace when he looked out over the city and he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. So he sent someone to find out who she was. And he was told that she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Verse 4, so David sent messengers to get her and she came to the palace. He slept with her. This is the Bible now giving us the details of the sin that David commits. But it goes beyond this initial sin of lust and adultery. It says, when we jump down to verse 14 of this passage in 2 Samuel 11. The next morning, after David discovers that Bathsheba has become pregnant. This is sometime after what we read in the first four verses here. Some time elapses and David discovers Bathsheba's pregnant. Now he, in verse 14, writes a letter to Joab and he gives it to Uriah, which is the husband of Bathsheba, to deliver. And the letter instructs Joab to station Uriah at the front line where the battle is the fiercest... And then pull back so that Uriah would be killed. So let me fill in the blanks a little bit. I kind of jumped ahead too quick. But we read about in 2 Samuel 11, these first few verses, the famous sin of David, which is that he looks out and discovers this beautiful woman and lusts after her in his heart. He goes so far as to have her summons to him because he is the king and he has the power to do that. He abuses his position of power as king. And as a result, by sleeping with her, she becomes pregnant. She's married to this man, Uriah, who we learn about in Scripture is a faithful servant of the king who serves in the king's army, this man, Uriah. And so now David is faced with this very question that we began with in the beginning. What does he do now that he's committed this egregious sin? He makes another very poor choice. He compounds one mistake with another... In that he gives instruction for Bathsheba's husband Uriah to be sent to the front line where the battle is the most intense, the most fierce. And even goes so far as to say once everyone's at the front line have all the men draw back. So it's almost certain that Uriah would be killed. So let's pick it back up just reading the last verse here. Verse 17 it says when the enemy soldiers came out of the city to fight Uriah the Hittite was indeed killed along with several other Israelite soldiers. This again is a very famous story and a very famous failure and sin and period of sin for King David where he, as I said, commits one sin, then attempts to deal with it and cover it up so that he he can save face, if you will, or try to... Uh, use, have some discretion so, not, so no one would find out, so people wouldn't have to find out and he wouldn't be ashamed. And if you and I are being honest today, not that we have to have confession here this morning, but we've probably experienced something similar in our lives of faith. When we've fallen into sin, when we've, when we've committed a sin that we know again is against God, something that doesn't please God, Our first instinct a lot of times is to not let anybody know. We don't want anybody to know that we we made the mistake of, of being tempted to sin and failing in our walk with God. We want to try to brush it under the rug as fast as we can. And it's only natural. That's our natural reaction to when sin is exposed in our hearts and lives. And so David, in this case, compounds one sin with another which results in actually taking the life of Uriah. When you really look at sin, and it's difficult to examine it in our lives and our hearts, it's much easier to look at it as we are today in the life of somebody else and to realize just why God hates sin so much. We hear that at times, and we feel like we have some theological understanding of why God hates sin. But here, when we see the effects of sin in the lives of people and we understand 
the detrimental effects it has in our lives and our families, we step back and we can truly appreciate why God takes such a hard line against sin, why he hates it so much. Sin causes so much destruction, so much hurt. Sin causes us to do things that are so displeasing to God. We do it because, again, of shame and of guilt and we want to try to cover it up. We're embarrassed and all of the things that come when we allow sin in our lives. It's no wonder God repeatedly in Scripture warns us and repeatedly advises us to stay so far clear of it because it does such tremendous damage. If you've lived in the world system, of course, at any time prior to coming to faith, we all know and we all understand that when we're living by the flesh, we want to justify sin because it's pleasurable, because it's enjoyable, and because we feel good when we partake in it. And that all might be true as well. There might have been periods in life when we lived sinfully and we enjoyed it as a fleshly and sinful person. But it doesn't negate the fact of how detrimental sin still is when we live a life of sin. And that's just here on earth. Never mind the eternal consequences, which again, God warns us about in tremendous fashion throughout Scripture. That God just cannot tolerate it. It cannot be in His presence. And so if we choose to live a sinful life, never having asked for forgiveness, never having experienced the mercy of God, God is clear in that we will be separated eternally from him and his, and his presence. There's an even greater consequence. That's why in Romans, Paul writes a verse that we all know to be famous again about sin. It says the wages of sin is death. There is a price to pay for sin. And it is death. It is separation from God. Thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, as easy as it is for us to fall into sin and to allow sin in our hearts... And to separate us from God. God has made it just as easy for us to experience freedom from it. I'm so thankful that God does not just allow us to remain in sin and remain separated from him. But instead, he says there's an easy way for you to deal with the sin in your life and the sin in your heart. The Bible says if you confess your sins... To God, then He is faithful and just to forgive you. You know, this isn't, I get part, part way through this, this is not the real exciting, encouraging sermon all of us love to hear about, but it is an important one. As your pastor, it's a passage and a scripture and a message that I have to share with you because I don't want to see any of us get derailed in our walk of faith because we've tripped up with sin in our hearts. Things that maybe you felt no one even knows about. But between you and God, God does know about it. I, want, I don't want to condemn you. I don't want to judge you for it. But I want to tell you that you have to experience God's forgiveness. Don't feel like you're going to withhold it from everybody and that keeping it a secret from God is somehow getting you ahead. No, God says that's not the way to deal with sin at all. I want you to confess it to me. I want you to, to admit to it. I want you to ask with a repentant heart. For me to forgive you. And God says, I'll, I'll forgive you every time. I'll forgive you every time. When we jump ahead, and we're not going to look there, but certainly on your own time you can. We would read in 2 Samuel 12 that David comes to a point sometime after in his kingship, in his life. After now he's committed this egregious sin with Bathsheba. Had her husband killed Uriah. He takes Bathsheba to be one of his wives. It was a different time and a different era in 2 Samuel. And so from David's perspective, everything is on the up and up. And nobody needs to know about this great sin that he's committed with Bathsheba or having Uriah killed. He thinks essentially that he's kind of dodged the bullet, if you will. He's gotten away with it. Unfortunately, 2 Samuel 12 would tell us differently. The prophet Nathan comes to see the king in 2 Samuel 12. And they have an exchange and a conversation where now finally King David is confronted with the truth of the great sin that he has committed. Nathan, by the wisdom and the word of God, 
speaks to the king and confronts him about the sin that he's hiding in his heart and in his life. And again, David now is faced with the same exact decision as he is faced with earlier on. What does he do about this sin that he has allowed into his life? In this case, David makes a better choice. He decides that he is now going to admit and own up to this egregious sin, this ugliness that he's been carrying, and ask God for his mercy and forgiveness. King David makes the right choice here. As difficult as it is, of course, and as embarrassing as he might feel about that period of his life. And God, in his mercy, of course, as we've already mentioned, is faithful to forgive King David. Unfortunately, the story would go on to tell us that there were severe consequences for King David's sin. There's many in today's day when we talk about sin and we get around this conversation that you hear about and we sing about and we celebrate the grace of God and God's grace truly is, is tremendous. We should be eternally grateful for the grace of God. And in saying that, grace essentially is God's undeserved favor his undeserved mercy towards us. It doesn't, though, give us a license to live how we want, as if we have this get-out-of-jail-free card in our back pocket. That's not how grace is meant to be used and lived by in our Christian walk. That whatever sin we commit, it's no big deal because God will forgive us. No. The story today, the application today, is exactly the opposite. God will forgive us, yes, tremendous, 100%. But the consequences will still remain. We will still have to deal with the consequences of sin in our lives. Those that we hurt, those that we betray, our own guilt and shame that carries on, that we have to constantly remind ourselves God has forgiven. There are ripple effects from sin in our lives that maybe never leave. God forgives us and eternally we can be restored to him. But God continues to want us to just avoid it altogether. Our relationship with God can be restored, but sometimes the calamity and destruction of sin remains with us. It's important for us to realize that we have to guard our hearts. The Bible says to even flee the appearance of evil, just to stay Stay so far away from anything that resembles something that would separate us from God. In 1, Corinthians 20, or 1 Chronicles 21, as we wind down here this morning and consider again the life of David, as much as he had a heart for God, as we said in the beginning, as much as he wanted to please God and he wanted to rule and, and be a blessing to the people and the nation, he did all these things right. But scripture reports another instance in 1 Chronicles 21 where David again falls into the temptation of sin by way of pride and brings harm to the nation. Even though he was successful as we already shared last week, he guarded against it changing him. He wanted to remain true to God. But at a point in his reign, at a point in his kingship, he thought he knew better than God. That happens too when we find success at times. Those of us, as we've already mentioned last Sunday, who achieve, you know, promote, uh, get a promotion at work or find ourselves in a place of authority within our families or within our communities. It's easy for us to think we have the answers and we don't need God's help anymore. It's much easier to depend on God when things aren't going well and we need his help and we're desperate for him. Pride causes us to have this false sense of ourselves, it draws us away from relying on God. King David, in the passage I'm mentioning, again realizes his great sin and the harm that it brings the people and repents before God, but again suffers incredible consequence because of his sin. What is mercy? As we wrap up, this is one definition that I think is appropriate. Mercy is receiving what we do not deserve. God wants to extend mercy to us even though we may not feel like we deserve God's mercy. But God extends it to us anyway. 
But in the same breath, some would argue that mercy is receiving what we do deserve. That we still get what we deserve by the choices that we make in life. And that's the double-edged sword of allowing ourselves to fall into sin. On one hand, we receive God's grace and mercy. We don't deserve it, but we can be made free from sin. On the other hand, we still suffer the consequences and we do get exactly what we deserve. But here is the sign to us that mercy is available. When we reflect and consider the cross of Christ, he went through such incredible lengths to ensure that we would have available to us an opportunity to be restored to God. This is, of course, the message of the cross, the story of Jesus and the whole reason why he came. So that we could repent of our sins. And that word, of course, when we think about it, we hear it, we think we know what it means. It's simple. We turn from our ways. We make a 180 degree turn. We realize in the moment, as King David did in the stories we're looking at today, that I have done something incredibly bad, incredibly wrong, and I have done something that is displeasing and dishonoring to God. And I am now turning from that to turn back to God. That is exactly the way we need to picture repentance and mercy and God's grace towards us. To leave that sinful life behind, to leave those things behind us, and to experience God's love and grace towards us. And here's the last point I'll make as far as this important lesson goes, and a bit of a warning, I suppose, in the Word of God today for us. And that is this, that this forgiveness of sin, mercy, and grace, it is our choice to make. God doesn't force any of us to turn from our sin and to turn to him. That's, the again, the love of God. That he allows us, even though he realizes that it's going to hurt so many around us and it's going to bring such hurt in our lives, his gift of free will to us is that he will allow us to journey through life and make those decisions ourselves, hoping beyond hope that we will turn back to him. Today, and as much as this might be an old way of concluding a sermon like this, I would challenge each and every one of us today to take a moment of reflection in our own lives and our own hearts. And between you and God today, before you leave this place, you could pray and ask God to forgive you that you want to live that life that is free from sin, free from guilt and shame. You don't have to carry those things anymore. I want you to hear that part of the message as much as you might hear that there's something that you know in your life and in your heart that's displeasing to God. I want you to equally hear that God wants to wash that away today. You can have prayer today. We can pray together before you leave. You can just simply pray as we worship together here in our closing moments and ask God. And as we already read, he is faithful and just to forgive you. Can we just... Close a prayer. I'll invite the guys back up to help me here as we get ready to sing another worship song together. But let's just quiet our hearts. And again, I'll encourage you even to go so far as to close your eyes so that you don't have any distractions here in this moment. This is an important moment. I know every service and every time we end and we are encountering God's presence is important. But this is a matter of eternity today. It truly is. That if you have sin in your heart today or sin in your life, just surrender it to God. Ask Him to forgive you. Maybe you'll pray a prayer simply like this. And you can pray it right now here where you are. Right where you're sitting if you want. But you would just say, God, I realize today that I have this sin in my life. This sin in my heart. I pray that you would forgive me and help me to turn from it. So that I could live a life that is pleasing to you. That's, that's all that's required. Something like that where you pray and ask God and you say that you're sorry for what you've done. That you want God's help to be made new. And he will forgive you. He will clean that from your heart and life. What a tremendous blessing to be able to confess 
and to be freed from that burden, to have it lifted off our chests and to know that God just with his love and grace wants to help us. God, I thank you today for your word as difficult maybe as it might be to hear for us, that we would truly take it to heart. I pray for your people that are here today. God, beyond anything I could ever pray for any blessing or any type of uh, healing or anything that I could pray on this earth, the greatest prayer is that they would know you and that they would have a hope of eternity with you, God. That there would be no sin, no, nothing in their lives that would separate them from you. I pray that you would speak to our hearts that day by day we would, we would analyze our lives and hearts to be sure that we are nowhere near anything that is dishonoring to you. Any sin, God, we would just flee it. We would just resist any temptation, God, in our lives. We know that this world will bring all kinds of opportunities to sin and that any one of us are vulnerable, but with your help and with your strength, God, we know that we can overcome. We thank you today. In Jesus' mighty and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's... Uh, Let's take a chance this morning and worship God. I'll invite you to stand here and join us. And as we sing, it's about celebrating today what God has made available to each one of us. Why don't we stand together and let's see what we've got lined up. There's a couple of songs I wanted to sing together as we celebrate today. This great story of faith. That we could know God. That sin doesn't have to separate us anymore. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul your work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living He's our living hope. Sing it out. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. Yes, the King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on 